Hi, I'm Nature Chris. Today, I'm gonna to be showing you guys how to turn a piece of antler into a pressure flaking tool, like one of these, using only flint blades. So, the tools we're gonna to be using to carve our antler are these blades that are made out of Flint Ridge Flint. I struck these myself. Uh, if you want to see, learn more about how to do that, you can look at our flint napping video. But basically, these blades are really thin, really sharp. I can cut materials with them with ease, uh, but they're going to get a lot duller while I'm doing this. Now, the reason for that is antler is really hard, uh, but we're going to be softening that antler up. So one of the things that's going to aid us in this process is we're going to be pouring water on the antler, and this will help soak in and soften it up. Uh, it's one of the reasons why it's actually very advantageous for us to be working on a rainy day like today. So before we start, I want to show you how sharp and thin this flake is. Pay attention to this because the edges are going to change from use. This use wear can be analyzed later and compared against prehistoric artifacts so that we understand which ones are being used for things like cutting antler, which ones are used for cutting other things or processing other materials. We're going to start by pouring some water on our antler. Uh, now if I had really prepared this, I would have soaked it. But this water is gonna actually help soften it up. You can hear small bits of it are in there. Now I already he started this cut a while back. But basically, we're trying to cut through the, um, we're trying to cut through this outer layer of the antler and get into the sort of pithy, spongy core at which point in time we'll strike it with a rock and snap it. Wow, that's really shredding the rock. Now, it's interesting to note that the antler itself is actually a softer material than our stone tool. However, it's a much more elastic material, so it has resilience in ways that the stone does not. Switch sides. One thing that I think it's worth thinking about is how much of ancient life, you know, prior to the Industrial Revolution, really comprised these mundane tasks. And you can think of this as like a mundane task, but you can also think of it as a social activity. Because if I was in an ancient village, you can bet that I would have sat around talking to someone, you know, gossiping while I was doing this type of activity. You know, I mean, you know, that's that's the thing is human behaviors. We have what we need to do to survive, but then we have what we do to make our survival, you know, enjoyable. Pour a little more water on there. The technique we're using is called score and snap. We've already scored it by cutting this line here, and the snap part consists of me smashing with a rock. It's a real fun ooga booga type activity. Wow, that's strong. It's literally just like embedding itself in there. Um, Need to work on it more? I think we're gonna get a little bit more work on it, yep. So, I've done this type of activity before, and one of the really interesting things for me as an archeologist is that I observed the type of little breaks that were coming off of the flint tools I was using. And then immediately I went out into the field, found an archeological site, and observed a flake with the exact same type of breaks. And uh, this was in South Dakota. And at this site, there was tons of examples of tool sharpening marks for sharpening antler tools. So it looks like you have the whole like gamut of production of antler tools there, but I would never have even paid attention to it had I not gone out and tried to carve uh, you know, some antler myself. And that's, that's the real value of experimental archeology. span it, it, it takes things that you've seen a million times before and enables you to reinterpret them because you're seeing the things that you then yourself have learned.
you know, there's lots of activities I show you on the show, like flint napping stuff. They're really difficult. It took me years to learn to get good at. This is not one of those activities. This is stupid easy. This is just going back and forth till your arms feel tired, and then you smash it with a rock. But it's a behavior humans had to engage in because, you know, if I want a flint napping tool, and I lived, you know, in prehistory, that was the only way to get it. Just kind of this crud that comes off that's just like a mix of like antler debris and uh, like bits of stone. So, the way that water softens up antler, of course, it softens it up not just when I want to carve it, but also when I don't want it to be carved. Um, I learned this when I was working out in Portland, Oregon. So when I was working there, obviously it's really, really wet uh, during the winter, like basically late fall through winter and into spring. With it being wet and softening up my tools, I found it almost impossible to pressure flake while I was flint napping out in that climate. And basically it, came, it enabled me to realize that there's a seasonality of flint napping where you'd understand people's prehistoric lives. You either have to be in a place that's dry and probably not well lit enough to do flint napping or you have to be outside where it's too wet to do flint napping and this kind of forces people into making more of their tools during certain points of the year than at other times now this is just an observation for that that region it's it's not universal i think we might be ready to give it another go Smash that subscribe button. Oh, ow. We've got to move our toad off the tree so that he doesn't stop. Okay, okay. Oh. <laughs> Are you trying? Was, you're so bad at being a toad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> We're trying to help you. Word. He's gonna. All right. I peed on me. Uh, all right, let's do this. Oh, well, that was that was close. I could feel it bend. I feel it bend a lot. Like it's definitely. Ugh, it's it wants to go, but it's not quite. Man, I'm just like smashing up the antler. Mm. Try one more. Take it away. That worked. As you can probably see, this score did not work exactly as I wanted it to. Something a little cleanup work won't fix. But you see this type of stuff all the time in the archaeological record where it doesn't break perfectly on the score line because, you know, uh, I was lazy and I wanted to hit it with a rock before I should have hit it with a rock. So you can see where this is another one that I've used this score and snap method using uh, stone tools. Uh, there's one cut here. There's one cut here, um, and then here's another one where I've just done it as a single cut. Basically, this two cut method will enable me to not have the back part of this giving me kind of unusual leverage, and I can I can basically just get in where I need to without having this back part uh, sort of counterbalanced and whack up against my wrist. One thing I also want to point out: these tools they are chewed up from the process of cutting the antler. This tool was sharp enough that it actually cut me very slightly uh, when we were filming the beginning part. Uh, and it is now very dull. I mean, I can do this with it. This one also was serrated, and you can see the serrated edges has been almost entirely obliterated from the process. Because of this, the polish on them makes them really distinct. So when you look at these tools in archaeological contexts, one of the things I can do is microware analysis. 
when I analyze like an ancient tool under a microscope and I see this type of polish, it tells me, hey, these people were probably working a hard material like antler or bone, and it gives me insight as to what they were doing at the site itself. So although we were making antler tools in this park, we weren't the first people to be using them here. Uh, while I was scoping out this park for the project, I stumbled upon this base of a projectile point. Now, there's not enough of it here to really be diagnostic, but I have my suspicions that it's early archaic or middle woodland. Uh, but it's just kind of interesting to put in perspective the fact that we're not the first people here. And what we're doing is really, we're trying to emulate and learn from the people in the past. You know, that, that's, my, that's my approach when I do this type of stuff. So I hope you learned something today. I hope you enjoyed this video, uh, enjoyed watching it. And thanks, and I'll see you next time.